unfamiliar with you, uh, if you would just tell us your name, uh, a bit about your background, and uh, really what you've been doing for the last several years. My name is Joel Furman. I'm a medical doctor, a board-certified family physician, nutritional researcher. I'm an author of numerous books, over 10, six of which have been on the New York Times bestseller list. I've been working hard on writing books and seeing patients. And I also am president of the Nutritional Research Foundation and on faculty at Northern Arizona University Research Division, Health Science Division. And I have a research office there and we conduct some research on preventing cancer. And I also enjoy taking care of patients and helping people make complete recoveries from serious illnesses. And I often I have a medical, um, sent a medical office in New Jersey and I also have a retreat in San Diego where I'm there half the month and, p and guests come in with serious illnesses and we specialize in people who have food addiction and food issues who are overweight to help them resolve that. Not just lose weight but get the skills, the knowledge and, the, and to change their personality and desires and, and food preferences so they leave with the ability to continue to enjoy eating healthfully and stay on the program to, to reverse their illnesses, get well from diabetes, get well from heart disease, reverse autoimmune illnesses and of course have a much better, healthier, and happier life in their future. So I enjoy work, even though I'm very busy and write and speak and lecture, I'm still involved in patient care and enjoy that very much. If you would please summarize the main point of your book, Fast Food Genocide. Well, I think a lot of people recognize today that the American diet with all the fast food and processed foods lead to a population that's not just overweight, but a high rate of cancer, heart disease, strokes, and dementia. I think the part they're not that clear about is that as it's destroying your body and increasing risk of heart attack and cancer, they don't realize it's destroying your brain, affecting your personality, your judgment, your intelligence, and whether you get mentally ill or demented in later life. And what I'm saying right now, if 100 years ago, one in 100 Americans were mentally ill. Today, one in five are mentally, are mentally ill. So on one hand, I'm saying that the food we eat creates our personality to a degree and leads to extreme and profound unhappiness and an overall dysthymia or lowering of people's emotions and creativity. On the other hand, there's a tremendous destruction going on, tragedy, that's disproportionately affecting poor people and people living in inner cities in what we call food deserts. And when we study these populations, we see they're not doing well as far as the medical care. They're not doing well as far as their, not just their health care, but their health outcomes. They have more cancer, more heart attacks, more kidney dialysis, more kidney failure. And it's blamed on sometimes their race and there's bigotry involved in that. And I'm showing that no matter what the color of your skin, that this is related to diet, diets people are fed. And Caucasian populations have the same poor outcome with, in, with intellectual impairment, affecting their career, their economic viability and economic po potential, earning potential later in, as they get older, that we're talking here about how poor nutrition destroys people's future. And it's blamed on who they are, or what their genetics are, or the way, but it's really not due to that. It's really due to how poor nutrition destroys the brain and destroys your human potential, and also how processed foods and sugar and fast foods are the gateway drug to an alcoholism, drug use, and illegal drug use, and even crime, and how destructive our present food climate is to the well-being and future of our, of our country and of our race and how the degradation of the American diet over the last 50 years has um, destructive and far-reaching tentacles that penetrate almost all aspects of life. And we have to take a look at this and look at it seriously. And it's a very fascinating book that I think that people find very interesting. I don't think it's coordinated evil, but we know, for example, after the Civil War, when black Americans were first freed, there were more centenarians, more elderly people. Advancements in economic advancements in education and intellectual achievement. And then it was, so it wasn't until the Jim Crow laws were passed and they were driven into the inner, up, up out of the South into inner cities and in, where they couldn't get food that we start to see prob these, these problems start to develop. So there's a lot of issues going on and even, even pellagra which was a major illness back in the um, late 1800s, 
which with niacin deficiency from the corn and molasses and pork diet they ate back then, caused homicidal, suicidal behavior and aggravated violence in the South. And what I'm saying right now is that nutritional deficiencies and poor nutrition has aggravated violence for centuries. And good nutrition and proper nutrition makes the people that are less angered, more peaceful, more happy, more intelligent, and more considerate of other human beings. The media often reports that alcohol in moderation is part of a healthy diet. Uh, what do you think about alcohol's impact on our health? Well, I think alcohol is a known carcinogen, and any carcinogen in small amounts is not going to be that evident to be that bad. But as amounts get higher, it gets much more easy to study. You know, it's difficult to pull out all the risk factors and things people do wrong because they do so many things wrong. So it's hard to give so much, you know, credit to one thing because you know, that's why it doesn't look like eggs are so bad because they're eating meat and they're eating cheese and they're eating fried food, they're eating sugar. And how do you pick out one thing of all the, you know, 50 bad things they're doing? But of course, alcohol is significant risk factor for cancer. In women, for example, most of the studies that we look at so that even one glass a day, one glass of wine a day increases risk of breast cancer somewhere between 10 and 12 percent. So it's significant. It's a significant carcinogen. And the idea that it's protecting your heart or making you live longer, it's more poor science. You know, you're not going to, and people want to, want to, some reason they can continue to utilize things that are harmful to them. They want to think what they're doing is good for them. You know, we know the, th we know the most powerful anti-cancer lifestyle interventions we can do are to keep ourselves thin, eat a diet rich in vegetables, eat a wide variety of healthy plant foods that have rich in phytochemicals and antioxidants, and don't overeat and don't drink alcohol.